We're going we're gonna to delve into 2 Samuel. Uh, and we're actually starting chapter 6 today, which I have to say is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It just it has such great messages and it's such a great story and has a lot of good questions. And so we're going to dig in on that today. Um, so it's six o'clock. So why don't we just get started? Okay. So chapter six, Samuel, second Samuel chapter six. Uh, just remember what we finished with. We did the final defeat of the Philistines at the end of chapter five. Um, and so we have the sense that a new era is begun. And of course, David feels the same way. And so we have this new challenge that comes about. David again assembled all the picked men of Israel, 30,000 strong. Now, he's not taking them to war, but he is assembling an army. And so that's very important to remember. An army, though, for what we'll see is a sort of celebration or a sort of procession, not at all a war, okay? But it's big, it's, it's, it's glory, okay? Then David set, uh, and all the troops that were with him set out from Baalim of Judah. Okay, so here there's a little bit of a question with the translation. The actual Hebrew is Baalei Yehuda, which literally means the um, the lords of Judah, okay? So what does that mean? First of all, the word Baal, we also see, and it really means Lord, but in some contexts are also used to refer to pagan gods who are seen as a Lord, okay? Well, that's not the context here, for sure. There are two possible interpretations. One is they came from where the elders of Judah were, the important people, the lords of Judah, uh, another possibility is that there is actually a place called Baala, and that is, uh, let me see if I can find the source for this. Yeah, in uh, Chronicles, uh, we there is the use of that word Baala as a place, and it's actually a synonym for Kiryat Ya'arim. And I forgot to write down the source of that, but just believe me. <laughs> <laughs> there is a place called Baala, and so it could be that that's what it's referring to. They went from this place, Baala in Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, to which the name was attached, the name Lord of Hosts enthroned on the cherubim. Of course, we remember the cherubim are those angel thingies that are on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. They loaded the Ark of God onto a new cart and conveyed it from the house of Avinadav, which was on the hill. And Avinadav's sons, Uzzah and Achio, guided the new cart. They conveyed it from Avinadav's house on the hill, Uzzah walking alongside the Ark of God and Achio walking in front of the Ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel danced before the Lord to the sounds of all kinds of cypress wood instruments with lyres, harps, timbrels, cisterns, and cymbals. Okay, so let's let's remember what we have here. We have a, a, an entourage of 30,000 men, literally an army. We have um, a, a group of people. Uh, well, first of all, let's see. Uh, who are these people that are mentioned? We mentioned Abinadav. He lives on a hill. Uh, and he has two sons, Uzzah and Achia. So let's find, they, they of course are bringing the ark, but we have a bit of a history here. We've met these people before. So let's get back to 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now, this is, um, at the time, if you recall, um, the very beginning of the book of Samuel, we have um, the, the problems with uh, Eli and his sons, and we have um, their, their go to battle against the Philistines, and they take the Ark of the Covenant out of Shiloh, which was not a good thing to do. And the result was that the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant, and it's put it in a number of different places, all of which proved to be very bad 
for the Philistines, all kinds of terrible things happen to the people in any given place where the ark is placed. And therefore, at some point, the Philistines say, get it out of here, take it away. And they end up bringing it to Judah. And it goes to Beit Shemesh, and there's problems with it there too. And so if you look at chapter 6, verse 21, uh, so if you see, uh, so th it's now in, in Beit Shemesh, and let's say verse 20, and the men of Beit Shemesh ask, who can stand in attendance on the Lord, this holy God, and to show he go up from us? Every place this ark is staying, there's problems. So they like, they want to get rid of it, okay? So what do they do? They sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiryat Yarim to say, the Philistines have sent back the ark of the Lord, come down and take it into your keeping. The men of Kiryat Yarim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eliezer, uh, Elazar actually, Elazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. So here we meet uh, Abinadab, he's the father of the household, and he has a son Eliezer and uh, El Azar, excuse me, and they are going to watch the ark. So here we meet these people again. The ark has been sitting there all this time. Um, actually, in fact, I, I stopped too soon. If you go back to um, the end of chapter six there, go to the next verse, which is the beginning of chapter seven. Uh, no, ver excuse me, chapter seven, verse two. A long time elapsed from the day that the ark was housed in Kiryat Yarin, 20 years in all. Okay. So we learn from there that it was 20 years sitting in this house. And now, the, all these years later, David is says the time has come. Basically, what's happened with David, he has fought his battles. He has um, consolidated his rule. He has finally defeated the Philistines, which is the biggest enemy of Israel, starting in the time of Judges. And it's very, very significant, I believe, that the ark was first taken by the Philistines in the first great battle and defeat to Israel from the Philistines. And now David comes full circle because he's now finally gotten to a point 20 years later where he has defeated the Philistines completely. And so it's only natural that he says, OK, let's go back and fix things. Let's fit. Ultimately, what he's doing now is correcting the, in many ways, the destruction of Shiloh. The Philistines, when they took the ark, of course, they destroyed the tabernacle in Shiloh. And so now he's able to say, okay, let's start that correction. Let's go take the ark away from this home where it has been so lovingly cared for. And there's and there was actually blessing to the house of Avinadab. They didn't have any of the troubles that the other people had. Uh, but now is the time to bring the ark up to Jerusalem. And in many ways, and of course, this comes... Uh, right after the, the conquest of Jerusalem as well, which we saw two chapters ago. And um, so now David, and David already has a palace uh, in Jerusalem. If you remember, the king of Tyre sent him the cedars and helped him build the palace. So he has his reign. He has his capital city. He has defeated his enemies. And so the next part, the next step is, of course, to build a temple, to reconstitute the ark in a central place, similar to the tabernacle. The tabernacle grew out of the temporary tabernacle or the portable tabernacle in the wilderness. And when they came into the land of Israel, it was then established in Shiloh. It followed the same uh, model, so to speak, as the desert uh, tabernacle, except it was more permanent in nature, but it still didn't have a roof. The skins were still the roof, but the whereas in the desert, the tabernacle was made up of poles that they would then lift up and carry out, you know. But in, in the tabernacle in Shiloh, it was a permanent building, okay? But it's interesting that the, the roof was still uh, uh, skins or, you know, the way it was in the tabernacle, Any, uh, in the wilderness. Anyway, so now we're coming back and we see that uh, David says, okay, it makes sense now. And so he's going to this place, to this house, and he's going to bring up the uh, the ark. Now, um, and again, we have this huge procession. We have an army of people, and we have, um, it's all very regal. It's all very ceremonial. 
lots and lots of instruments. If you can imagine all, all the house of Israel dance before the Lord with all these instruments, with all these military men, you can imagine it's a very pomp and circumstance kind of scene. David is there as the king. He's probably in his fancy robes. He got a crown on his head, right? And the idea here, of course, is to bring honor to the Lord by bringing this ark up with all the ceremony uh, that it deserves. But something goes terribly, terribly wrong. Let's see what happens. But when they came to, I'm on verse six, but when they came to the threshing floor of Nachon, Uzzah reached out for the ark of God and grasped it for the oxen had stumbled. Now we notice above that it was Uzzah uh, who was walking alongside the ark of the covenant and Achio was walking in front. So Uzzah is in a position to see if there's going to be a problem with the cart. He sees the cart is somehow losing its footing. There is a danger that the ark will fall. Uh, and it would be a terrible, terrible thing for the ark to fall on the ground. I mean, you don't, that's not how we treat something that holy. And so what does he do? He, he puts out his hand to hold the ark so that it won't fall with this, with this, uh, with the, with the wagon because the, the ox, you know, stumbled. The, the wagon was about to tip. So he holds, he puts out his hand to hold the ark. The Lord was incensed at Uzzah. And God struck him down on the spot for his indiscretion, and he died there beside the ark of God. Now, this is a very, very troubling situation. There's no question that Uzzah's intentions were pure. He wanted to be sure that the, the ark does not go sprawling on the ground because these ox stumbled. So how is it that he is killed? And in such a dramatic way, so suddenly God strikes him down. It's like a picture like lightning, you know, coming out of the heavens and striking him dead on the spot. So clearly something was wrong. Now, I think most of you know that when we read our weekly Torah portion, the five books of Moses are divided into weekly portions. And every week we read a portion. After we finish the Torah portion, though, we read, we read a second portion portion uh, that's called the Haftarah, and that is coming from the books of the prophets, not from the five books of Moses. And generally, the Haftarah is selected to in some way connect to the, something that's in the Torah portion. Now, this chapter is actually read uh, in connection with the uh, Torah chapter that uh, talks about the death of Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu. They are killed, uh, and we that we read about this in uh, in uh, Shmini in, in uh, Leviticus. I'm just going to find it. Um, Leviticus ten. Now Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, each took his fire pan, put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and they offered before the Lord alien fire, which he had not enjoined upon them. And fire came forth from the Lord and consumed them. Thus they died at the instance of the Lord. Okay, a similar kind of situation. There's no question that Nadav and Abihu are doing this from pure motives. They are swept by the moment. This is at the point of time where they are dedicating the temple, dedicating the altar uh, of the temple. And uh, just before this, we, we witnessed the fact that uh, in the last verse of uh, chapter ten, of chapter 9 is um, fire came forth from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat parts on the altar. And all the people saw and shouted and fell on their faces. So we have this amazing spiritual moment where the altar is now being consecrated. They brought the first sacrifices on this altar in the tabernacle for the first time. And the response is that this fire comes from God uh, as a way of signaling, yes, your, your offerings have been accepted. But at that moment, it seems swept by the spirituality of the moment, wanting to get closer to God. What they do, these two sons, is they take their incest pans and they rush forward. Um, and they go forward before God. And, and the many people interpret this as being as they go into the Holy of Holies. 
um, the, the, there's also this understanding that where would the fire have come from? Would have come from within the holy and holies out to the out to the altar, and they're going into the holy holies where they're not allowed to go. Only the high priest can go into the holy of holies, and only on one day of the year, on the day of atonement. So, what we see here is an action that is wrong, but coming from pure motives. But what is the message there in, in that story in Leviticus? Um, well, at least one of the messages is when you worship God, God is not your path. God is not just some, you know, oh, hi, good to see you, you know, pray. You know, there has to be a degree of reverence, and that reverence needs to include distance. And so that God gave us a series of rules. This is what you do, and this is what you don't do. And unlike in many other walks of life, if we have a spiritual feeling, we can run with it so long as we're not doing anything wrong. When it comes to serving in the temple or the tabernacle, God is very specific about what you can and cannot do. And therefore, if you run afoul of that, bringing a, a uh, strange fire, you know, uh, I've given you some interpretations of that, but it's clear from the verse, whatever it is, it's not something that God wanted them to be doing. It's out of the protocol. And then, then that he would lie because that you cannot come that close to God unless you come in the right way, following the right rules. And so we're reminded, I think there's no question, our sages who put these two chapters together are basically telling us, and I think it's rather obvious, that the story we have here about Uzzah is a very similar story. Uzzah is a very good man. He's God-fearing. All he does is touch the ark. Now, you're not supposed to touch the ark. In a way, it's very similar to the Holy of Holies. The ark sits in the Holy of Holies. No one's supposed to touch it. Now, I will go even further. God is very specific about how you move the ark. So let's go back to the book of Numbers. Okay, and there's a few different places that I would just to show you where God is extremely specific about how the ark is supposed to be handled. Now, don't forget, the book of Numbers is written in the desert, so that's at a time when the ark is being moved all the time because everything there is, is uh, movable, transportable. Every time they, they move camp, they take apart the tabernacle, and so God gives very specific instructions how the ark is to be moved. So if you look at Numbers chapter 4, first of all, verse 5, when at the breaking of camp, Aaron and his sons shall go in and take down the screening curtains and cover the Ark of the Covenant with it. So there's a, so first of all, you're covering the Ark. So to, to it's a certain, again, a sign of reverence. Uh, and then verse 10, uh, they shall put it in all its furnishings into a covering of dolphin skin, dolphin skin, which they shall then place on a pole. Okay, now you've seen... I know you've seen this kind of pole. You know the picture of the spies coming back from the land of Israel with the with the grapes, the big grapes. Okay, so picture that pole on the shoulders of the people carrying it. Here, the way all of the um, all of the vessels in the tabernacle have these uh, loops at the side of it and poles that string through it, and so they would pick up the ark, not by touching the ark, not by holding the ark itself, but by picking it up by these poles and then carry it on the poles. And so this is what it's telling. They should place them on these poles. And then we look at verse um, 15. Uh, it says, um, uh, let's see, yeah. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sacred objects and all the furnishings of the sacred objects at the breaking of camp, only then shall the Kohatites, the, from the sons of Kohath, come and lift them so that they do not come in contact with the sacred objects and die. Okay, it's very, very specific here. You're not supposed to be touching these objects. Then we have, in also in Numbers, chapter 7, it's even more specific, chapter 7, Verses eight and nine. And four carts and eight oxen he gave to the Merorites as required for their service under the direction of Itamar, son of Aaron the priest. 
But the, the Kohatites, now remember, it's the Kohatites who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. He did not give any, he didn't give any hearts. Since theirs was the service of the most sacred objects, their porterage was by shoulder. So here, the Bible makes it very clear. When it comes to the Ark of the Covenant, you do not put it on a wagon. You lift it by the poles and you carry it on your shoulder. Now, this same story that we're involved with now in uh, 2 Samuel, as many of the stories, most of the stories in 2 Samuel are repeated with some distinctions, and we're not going to get involved in what those distinctions are, but in, in the book of Chronicles. So if you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 15, it refers to the same story, except interesting enough, it has just a, a slight hint at what went wrong the first time David brought up the ark and kind of slides right into the second time. But it has here, within that hint, gives you a perspective that really reflects what we're talking about. So it's second, it's the first Chronicles chapter 15, uh, verse 15. The Levites carried the ark of God by means of poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. So it's very clear that when they did it the second time, okay, they did it by poles on their shoulders. And there's this slight uh, hint that things were not done right the first time. And that was in chapter uh, verse 13, just before that, because you were not there the first time, the, the Lord uh burst out against us for we did not show due regard for him. So there's there that hint that this is the second time and they're doing it right this time. And then we have, of course, in verse 15, how they do it right. They carried the ark on their shoulders. So from this, we can see that despite the fact that Uzzah was a very good man, he did it wrong. And it's not to say that he did it wrong, but the whole situation was wrong. David did it wrong. David is directing the whole operation. He clearly told them, get a wagon, put the ark on it. He messed up. He didn't pay attention to these very specific rules that had already been given to us in, in the uh, by Moses in, in the Bible. Okay, now let's continue reading the story. And, and the, what are we trying to do today is have an understanding of what went wrong and then what went right. Okay, so we already saw there's a problem with Uzzah. Touching the ark, we saw the problem on the fact that it was on a wagon and not being carried. Verse 6. Uh, oh, no, no, so we got that already. Okay, verse 8. David was distressed because the Lord had inflicted a breach upon Uzzah, and that place was named Peretz Uzzah, as it is still called. Okay, so first of all, let's pay attention to the Hebrew words here. The word that is distressed in Hebrew is vayicha. Now, usually the word vayichar goes together with the word af. It literally means uh, smite your nose or something like that. <laughs> it's a, an expression that means anger, okay? And in fact, just um, a few verses early, uh, no, at verse 7, right before, we learn that God was angry at Uzzah. The word there used is the same vayichar, but it has the word af next to it. And there it is clearly angry. The Lord was angry at Uzzah. Here in verse 8, it has the word vayichar, but it doesn't have the word af. So there's a question, does it still mean angry or does it mean something else? So here it says David was distressed. And indeed, there are many who, who um, translate the word that way in this context, that he was saddened, he was distressed over what happened. He was distressed at what happened to, to uh, Uzzah. The question is, was he angry or was he distressed at God? In other words, so people go out of their way to say, it cannot be he's angry because he wouldn't have been angry at God for this. He was distressed at what God did to Uzzah. Does that necessarily mean he was angry? Okay. Okay. So that's one way of looking. Of course, there are people they will say, say he was angry, that it means angry. So then the question is, who was he angry at? Maybe he was angry at Uzzah. Oh, you messed up, Uzzah, right? Maybe he was angry at himself because he's the orchestrator of this whole thing. And he, I'm sure, realized something in the way this was set up was wrong. Uzzah was an innocent here. Uzzah only wanted to ensure that the ark didn't fall. 
And therefore, he has to look at himself and take responsibility. And I think this is such a, a wonderful interpretation because it also tells us so much of David. David is not an angel. He's this amazing king. And we know, and both Christians and Jews share the belief that the Messiah is coming from the house of David. Dave, what, what did David and God spoke to David and promised him? Kingdom will always be from you. Even when he splits the kingdom uh, after Solomon's death, he he keeps the house of David as an everlasting kind of, 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 of uh, kingship that will come back. And he had to have done something to deserve it. You know, he was a very great king, but he was not perfect. One of the things that's so amazing about David is that he's willing to take responsibility when he does something wrong. He, he doesn't have that ego that we saw, for example, in Saul and how Saul's ego ate him up, literally, and destroyed. I mean, Saul was a good man. Saul was a God-fearing man. But Saul's ego just ate him up, his obsessions and his jealousy, all that ate him up. And David, on the other hand, never has a problem stepping back and say, oh, my gosh, I did something wrong. I am terribly sorry. How do I fix this? And so I like this interpretation that he's actually angry uh, at himself. Another thing that's very interesting is the word parrots. In the English word for this is that there was a breach or a burst forward. Okay. What is this breach? Um, it could also be like an explosion, that kind of breach, like this violent breach. So it could be this idea of God striking death is like this explosion or this striking this breach through the heavens, you know, you know, striking him dead. And therefore he calls the plates Peretz Uza. Peretz is the Hebrew word that it's used here for the breach or for the striking dead. Um, and he calls it after that. But it's also very interesting because in a previous chapter, when we talked about the final defeat uh, of the Philistines, if you look at chapter five, verse 20, um, thereupon David marched to Baal Pratzim. It's the same words. And we see here, what did he do? David defeated them there and he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies. It's exactly the same word. The breaking through that's here used to talk about God's striking down. Uzzah, the same words is here is used that God broke through my enemies. And, and, and he names that place using the same word Peretz or Pratzim in this case, as he, as he does here, naming it Peretz Uzzah. But what a difference, okay? We have there the word is used for God's same kind of bursting through in strength, but for salvation. And here we have God bursting through in strength and striking down somebody. And I think that also helps us understand in the previous situation, it's a very pagan, it's God, uh, David is surrounded by the, the pagan relics uh, of the Philistines. And so what he does there is he's kind of, um, uh, in a symbolic way, he's saying, oh, these pagan relics are, are not for us. And he gets rid of them and he destroys them. And um, he kind of separates himself from the Philistines in that way. Here, he's doing the exact opposite. He's doing something to sanctify God's name. He, there's no pagan worship here. But perhaps what you, the same words being used is a message that is saying, um, pagan gods don't have real holiness. You can touch them, you can throw them, you can do whatever you want to them. When you're dealing with the Ark of the Covenant, you've got to deal with it completely different. And that, you know, kind of illustrates that contrast we have there using the same the same type of the same word uh now we'll continue da uh, verse nine david was afraid of the lord that day he said how can i let the ark of the lord come to me so david would not bring the ark of the lord to his place in the city of david instead david diverted it to the house of oved edom the gittite the ark of the lord remained in the house of oved edom the gittite three months and the lord blessed oved edom and his whole household so initial, the David's initial reaction is, Ugh, forget it. This was a failure. Let's go back, put it in somebody's house. I, I can't deal with this right now. And then he sees that, the, and, and, and the ark sits in that person's house for three months. Now, this is parallel to what had happened before when it was sitting in the house of Abinadav and Kiryat Yarim, and 20 years of blessing. 
and, and good fortune to that family. And so he sees that it is possible to be in the, in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. It is possible to move the Ark of the Covenant. It's not like voodoo. It's not like, you know, this pagan kind of thing that this brings bad luck. And like with the Philistines, they wanted to get rid of the Ark because they said, no matter where it is, it's going to cause disease and, and plagues and whatever. Um, and, and God here is saying, no, 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 it's not the Ark. The Ark's fine. The Ark is not a magic amulet. The Ark is a representation of God's holiness. And if you treat the representation of God's holiness with the appropriate uh, reverence and follow the rules that God himself has laid down, you're going to be fine and you will be blessed. And so this already opens up the door for David to try again. And we see here in verse 12, it was reported to King David, the Lord has blessed Oved Adom's house and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. Thereupon David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Adom to the city of David amid rejoicing. Okay. And what we're going to take up with next week is what happens the second time. What is it that David does differently the second time that makes the journey a success? And how does he correct what happens? Now, there's no question. He's not going to put it on a wagon. He's going to carry it on his shoulders. And that we already saw specified for us in um, in the book of uh, Chronicles. But there's a lot of detail here, and I'm going to share with you uh, a teaching that I learned once from one of my Bible teachers that I think is just brilliant, seeing in all these little details how we see a major transformation of David and how he approaches the whole, the whole journey with that ark. Totally different kind of situation next time around. Okay, so we will take it up from there. Uh, we'll start with um, verse 13 next week. Any comments or questions? I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. Two, two, two. One is the Hebrew word Perez that you explained, um, make a breach. Isn't that the same word that one of Tamar's sons was named because he yes. made a breach for himself? Because he breached in the birth. Right. right. It's right, the same exactly word. Exactly the same word in Hebrew, parrots. Yes. You're okay, good. And, my and this question, is an ancestor of David. Yes, he is the ancestor. Boaz came through from that's David. right. That's yes. right. That's right. Right. The other question is more personal. Why is it that you like this particular chapter? When you see what and I do. You open the week. study saying that it's your favorite. Because of what we're going to learn next week. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I suppose by next week, he'll have read numbers and knows how to carry the ark. But the question is, why didn't he know it already? Well, that's a good question. And I don't have an answer to that other than to say he was not careful enough. But I think what I'm going to teach next week is going to show you not just that he didn't have that particular detail down pat, but that his attitude was all wrong. And that created all the problems that happened, including putting it on the, the wagon. But you're going to have to stay tuned for next week. Yes, Lynn, you have a question? Um, I can't remember where, but somewhere or other, it does say that the king is supposed to write out a copy of the law for himself. So if David yes. had done that, he would have known how to move the ark. So would he, when we're talking about the angry, would you think he could have been angry at himself because he hadn't? Done what he was well, I'm sure he's angry at himself because he didn't do it right. Yes. Uh, the question is, did he know it? Did he know it and forget it? Did he know it and not pay attention? Did he think it wasn't that critical? I mean, those questions, I really, I can't get into, I don't know that. We don't have enough information. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you, I'm looking for it, that in, it's what you're referring to is in Deuteronomy chapter 17, um, I think this is where it is. Yes, yes. Deuteronomy 7, uh, 17, verse 18. This is part of the instructions to a king. When he is seated on his royal throne, he shall have a copy of this teaching, this Torah, written for him on a scroll by the Levitical priest. Let it remain with him and let him read in it all his life so that may he, he may learn to revere the Lord his God 
to observe faithfully every word of this teaching as well as these laws. Thus he will not act haughtily, haughtily toward his fellows or deviate from the instruction to the right or to the left to the end that he, and he and his descendants may reign long in the midst of Israel. So clearly he didn't, whether or not he had the Torah scroll with him or not, had it written already, that we don't know. The scripture never tells us that he writes a Torah scroll. Uh, he clearly wasn't paying attention or he forgot. Um, but I think that the message here about having that Torah scroll with him, not just to ensure that he obeys all the details of the laws, but that it avoids him going in the direction of ego, arrogance, haughtiness, that's definitely related to what we're going to see next week. <clears throat> okay. And the reference that you were looking for for before was wrong, 1 Chronicles 13, 6, Curious. Um, yeah, the, the 2 Sam 6, 2 cross-references to 1 Chronicles 13, 6. Oh, and this is when they, they brought it up. And they, the, oh. others, the Chronicles version of the story. Yeah, and also yeah. Joshua 15, verse 9. According to <laughs> Joshua, could there be, this is Maria speaking. Could there be another way to sustain the ark, avoiding from falling? Yeah, like? on the poles, carrying yeah. on the poles on the shoulders, which is what they ended up doing. Okay, but in the moment before reaching that level of putting it in, using the 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 poles. Probably, was there another thing that they could have done? Well, it, when it's set in place, nothing's going to happen to it. It's going to be stable. It's on. It's on. It's on the ground. Mm. It's there. It's stable. So it's only. I mean, if there's an earthquake, well, you know, nobody's going to be able to solve that problem. But you know, yeah. the idea being, you don't pick up the rock and put it on a wagon. You put it on. The poles are there. And most of the pictures that we see today drawn of the ark, it's with the poles in it. The poles mm -hmm. were kept there so they could at any moment go like this. And that's how they moved it. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming, look, there was also, there's no question, we don't see this specifically in the uh, scriptures, although um, we assume it and our traditions tell us about it. People would have had to go in and clean. You know, in addition to when the high priest goes in, people would have had to go in and clean, but they went in in a very specific way. And it's possible that when they cleaned underneath the ark, they lifted it with the poles and then put it down again. You know, so I'm assuming that's something that would have happened. So the poles were there. You mm -hmm. know, they were always there. Mm -hmm. Now, Solomon's temple might have been a little different, but uh, it's not clear. Uh, but it's and, and Solomon's temple had a lot of cherubim, and they were not only on the ark; they were across the big and across the. It, Solomon's temple is very different. But right now, we're we're in the original ark. This is the same ark that Moses made. Mm -hmm. It's the same one, and and it was in all these years, almost four hundred years, it was sitting in the tabernacle in Shiloh, and from there it went to different places. So it's the original ark with the poles. I suppose it was difficult because Merari and Gershon were given carts for carrying all the other things in the temple, in, right. in the tabernacle, but the uh, Kohathites were not given an, um, any carts for carrying because they had to carry everything on their shoulders. So right. perhaps so many hundred years had elapsed since that, that David had thought, oh, well, the others have had got carts, so perhaps it's all right to have a cart for the, uh, for the tabernacle. But you know what? It's also very interesting because it's also a possible interpretation of what happens when the ark is returned from the Philistines. They put it on a cart. Yeah. Now, the Philistines don't know the rules, so they put it on a cart. But we see when it gets to Beit Shemesh, there's also problems there. And it's very possible that part of the problem is it's on a cart. And, and then they take apart the cart. There's this whole thing. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Uh, when they come... It's, a, it's at the beginning. Uh, 1 Samuel here, 4. Uh, here we go. Um, here we go. And the, this is on uh, chapter 6, okay? 
The people of Beit Shemesh were, re uh, uh, this is 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13. The people of Beit Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. They looked up and saw the ark, and they rejoiced when they saw it. The cart, again, this is the cart the Philistines put it on, came into the field of Joshua of Beit Shemesh, and it stopped there. They split up the wood of the cart and presented the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. A large stone was there, and the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest beside it contained the gold objects and placed them on the stone. Okay? So first of all, you see that they lifted the ark, but we don't, it could be they lifted it with its poles, and they immediately destroyed the wood of the cart. So it's very possible that they themselves understood that the cart was something that the Philistines were doing. We've got to get rid of it. Carts and arcs don't go together. And so they, they split it up. But then we have this, uh, uh, then we have in verse 19, though, the Lord struck at the men of Beit Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. So already then, and that was, you know, 20 years earlier, that's it. There was already a, a striking of Lord at these people who did not do the right thing. Now they may have held the ark on the pole and set it up where you know on some stone or whatever, and they broke up the cart. But they looked at the ark. They got too close. No matter how you define it, they got too close, and that's all part of the same. And, and we remember what about this looking at the ark? What we the, the verses we read in the book of Numbers talk about before they transport, they have to cover the ark, yeah. putting, you know, blankets or, or, or furs or whatever over, over the cart, uh, the ark, and only then doing it. And there's also this tradition that what happened was the sons of Gahat walked backwards into the Holy of Holies and kind of draped the ark, uh, the blanket or the, 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 the material, whatever, over the ark so that when they turn around to carry the ark they never really see it because they've already covered it so these are just some of the details i think if you put together what we know in numbers and what we've seen in different parts of first samuel this is something that they kind of know about sort of <laughs> you know anyway we will take that up next week it's good to see you all